so much for joining us today. And a big welcome to this fourth in the series of webinars by the Urban Development Network on Sustainable Urban Development. My name is Sally Nishaw, and I'm your moderator this morning. I'm very happy to be taking you through the next two hours, and I will be joined by my co-moderator, Eddie Adams, shortly. This series of webinars is based on a handbook by the Joint Research Centre of the European Commission, focused around six building blocks for sustainable urban development. And today it's our fourth session, the fourth webinar. We're going to focus on cross-sectoral integration what that means, why it's important, and most importantly, how to do it and how to do it better. We're going to have some fantastic inputs on theory and practice on the, from the handbook itself and get some insights from cases across the European Union, two from city level and one at regional level, to show how they have worked to improve the integrated approach at their level. We're also going to have some reflections from our expert rapporteur and some comments about the future, what this means for future programming periods within cohesion policy and what the integrated approach might look like in the next generation of structural funds. As I said, this is the fourth of six webinars in the series. We hope you already joined us for some of the earlier webinars. If you didn't manage to catch them live, they're now online on the Urban Development Network website. So we'll put in the link, some, in the chat, some links to those. You can look at the presentations and the recordings to catch up on the previous webinars. And still a chance to join us for the next two webinars, uh, webinars five and six. And we'll tell you a bit more about that when we've finished up by the end of this morning. The purpose of these webinars generally is to deepen our understanding about sustainable urban development within cohesion policy and to help all of us who are working at different levels, so at city level, at regional level, at national and European level, to understand better, to build capacity, to improve the way that we design projects and investments in a more sustainable way that will lead to more resilient and attractive cities. I'm going to show a slide about the etiquette of this platform at the moment. We're on WebEx, as you can see. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. We're going to uh, so I'll just actually, first I'll go through the program. Oh, so here's the etiquette. Sorry, a bit of confusion there. Let's stick to the etiquette first, please, on that slide. Um, we want to hear, we will have you muted at all times, and we'll use the chat box uh, on the, on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, if you want to put a chat, or a, a comment or a question for any of the presenters or give us some examples from your own experience, please do. And we will pick those up at various uh, moments during this morning. Uh, but please make sure that you select the bottom uh, option in the chat bar, which is to everyone. Uh, and during the question slide, please feel free to add more questions in there. That way, we, everybody will see your, your comments and questions. And please be reactive when we launch the polls. Uh, join in, uh, tell us what you're doing, and also tell us how the Urban Development Network can support you going forward. We're, we're keen to know what can be done to help you, as well as these kind of webinars, what tools and processes would be useful for you. So let's look at the program now. Let's go back to the program slide, please. And this is what we're going to do for the next two hours. Uh, you can see we're going to start with an introduction from uh, Carlotta Fioretti from the, uh, the Joint Research Centre. Carlotta is going to set the theme for us about the handbook and also uh, a bit more of a focus on what integration means and how we integrate across policies and sectors and departments. Uh, we're going to have a couple of polls, both before and after Carlotta, to check in with you about where you are, who you are, and what integration means for you. Uh, and Eddie Adams, my co-moderator, will take us through that. Uh, the first learning from practice case will be uh, from Tuscany. From the region of Tuscany, we have Alessandra Dorensis, who works for the Managing Authority, and she's going to tell us how they have improved the way they uh, encourage and incentivize an integrated approach in the way that they uh, design their, oper their operational program and encourage projects to come forward in a participatory approach. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how, how the processes and structures at that level uh, can really support cities to be doing the right thing at local level. Then we'll take a break and get some reactions from our rapporteur. Our rapporteur this morning is Adele Buccella. 
She is uh, the Head of Projects and Programming at the Urbat Program, and she is, uh, uh, she is going to give us some inputs at that point. I'm just wondering if there's a problem with sound. I'm looking in the chat bar. There's some people who can't hear. Maybe my colleagues could tell me if uh, there's a problem with sound. Sound is breaking, it said. So I'll go quickly through the program, then hand over. Um, we're also going to have some inputs at this point, possibly from Laura Liger. Laura works for the European Commission in the Regional Policy Directorate, and she's going to be the one who helps us focus a bit on the future of programming um, and what, that, what integration will look like in the future of structural funds. Around about 11 o'clock, we'll take a break. Thanks for telling me in the chat that we can hear okay. That's good to know. Always difficult when you're not listening live. Uh, around 11 o'clock, we'll take a break so you can get a cup of coffee, have a stretch. Then when we come back, we're going to have two uh, inputs from city cases, learning from practice at local level. The first is from Nicolae Moldovan, who is the city manager of Alba Iulia in Romania, who's going to talk about ways in which they built capacity to, to, to develop projects, citywide projects that are integrated across departments and sectors. And then we're going to have Heidi Tensi, who is the funding manager from the strategic funding office at the city of Ghent in Belgium. Uh, and she's going to talk about, a bit more about the internal structure of the city and ways in quite, quite uh, it's really intelligent ways of making sure that colleagues talk to each other, that departments connect to build the best sort of joined up projects and work that they can do it, it within the city. Uh, and then we'll come back to Adele, our, our rapporteur, to see if she has any reflections and bring us back to what that, um, how that connects to the recommendations in the handbook. And then finally, we'll bring Laura back in from the European Commission to tell us about the future. Uh, so that's a great uh, program, two hours, quite a lot of content there. We have asked all of our speakers to stick to 10 minutes, and I know that's really hard because they've all got a lot more to say but it means that we can get this really rich diversity of content this morning and, and hear from very different perspectives of how to approach sectoral integration. So that's this morning's uh, program. I'm now going to hand over to my co-moderator, Eddie Adams, to uh, launch the first poll and see where you all are this morning and how you're doing. Thanks a lot, Sally. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning. Great to see you all with us. Um, Thanks for telling us on the chat that uh, you've been having little blips. Uh, that's what the chat bar is for. As Sally said, we're hoping to get your thoughts on, on the content, questions, comments, observations, but also just keep us posted if there are any little blips. Um, we're on session four here, so we're feeling a little bit more relaxed. Not so relaxed I'm in my pajamas, but um, you know we're a bit more relaxed than we were at the start, but we're still keeping an eye on the technical stuff, so please let us know uh, if you have any difficulties. Okay, we're going to um, come out to you now, and um, if you've been with us before, you'll know that uh, at this stage we like to know who's in the room. So we've got a couple of, well, we've got three poll questions for you. Uh, the first one, which we can just maybe pop on the chat bar, Vasily, so let's have a look at the first one. If you've been with us before, you'll know this. If you're new, we're interested to know if you're joining us for the first time. So, is this your first UGN webinar? Are you joining us today for the first time, or have you been in any of our previous three sessions so far? I'll just give you a minute to, uh, to, to answer the question. As Sally said, if you missed any of the earlier ones, they've all been recorded. The material is being sent out. It's on the, the, uh, the website, so easy for you to access the previous uh, uh, sessions, if you missed any of those, uh, Vasilis, I think we can quickly go to the um, to the, the answers there because the uh, quite an easy question. Let's just see what the response is. Let's take the last 20 seconds. Okay. So from the point where we close the poll, it takes 20 seconds to load up the answer. That's why there's a little bit of um, delay between the the result between the, the the closing the poll and getting the results. So I'm curious to know how many people are joining us for the first time today. Okay, not so many. Okay, so more than half of you um, are have been with us before. We're still getting a third of you not answering. I'm not quite sure. You know, we can't make the question any easier than that. So uh, you know, please join in. Uh, the purpose of this is so we can uh, get some feedback from you. It helps our speakers. It helps us. And um, let's keep going to the second um, second question. Uh, I can see there's still some sound problems on the chat bar. We can look into that while we're going through this, so apologies. I hope you can follow the logic of the, the polls, even if you maybe can't hear my voice. 
Um, second question is, uh, what hat are you wearing today? Um, which kind of organization do you represent? Uh, are you a managing authority or an intermediary body? Are you from a national organization, city authority? You can see the list there. We've got the regional level, NGOs. So just take a minute, please, and tell us what kind of organization you work for, just so we get a flavor of who's in the room. And then we found in most of these sessions that around half of our participants have been managing authority and city people in the previous session. So let's see if, if we have the same balance today or if the, um, the range is a bit different. Okay, I'll give that a couple more minutes to, or a couple more seconds actually, just to, to, to finish. And then we can maybe push the button by Celis and have a wait for the responses to come up. Last uh, 20 seconds now. Okay, great stuff. Thank you. It's good we've had a spread across everyone. So we've had, you know, about 10% of uh, the participants have been university research people. We've had a fairly good input from private sector uh, people. We've had NGOs on, the, on these calls. So, you know, it's been a nice mixed audience from our perspective. Let's have a look. So city people, 22%, managing authority, 18%. Uh, my arithmetic was never brilliant, but that's 40%, almost half, just about. 10% uh, universities, that's been consistent, that, that research side. So um, that, that's a, a nice spread again, 7% private sector. Okay, that's really, really interesting for us to hear. And um, let's just move to the third poll. This is a little bit different. This one is really just trying to be a little bit playful in a time when things are quite tricky and difficult for many of us. If you had a superpower, which superpower would be most useful to help you working digitally during the pandemic? This is welcome to our new world. This is the way we are living our lives these days. So all the things we, we miss and lose from these physical meetings, well, what would be most useful for you to, know, to be able to do? Telepathy, super speed of your Wi-Fi, and I think we can all identify with that. Uh, time travel, or maybe you already have a superpower. And if you have, we would love to know what it is, so tell us in the chat bar. So which of those superpowers would be most useful for you in the current lockdown that most of us are experiencing at the moment? Okay, this is just a little bit of fun, this one. So let's push the pause button on this one, Vasilis, and then we'll just wait a couple of seconds for the answers to. Let's uh, give them about uh, 30 seconds more. Okay, okay. Um, and I think you know one of the big things we all realize working like this is we are all on a huge learning curve. It's certainly been a big learning curve for the core team involved in these webinars. And um, each time we do this, we learn new things, and you'll be the same. Uh, the last your 20 seconds. Okay, here we go. So let's just see which of these super parts, telepathy, super speed of your Wi-Fi, time travel, or maybe your uh, I'm teleworking. From home mother, yeah, that's that's a real superpower. If you're juggling young kids and you're juggling uh, home life and work, you have my biggest uh, congratulations. So, uh, what have we got? Yeah, time travel with the biggest one. Okay, a nice even spread there. So, thank you for joining us today. Uh, stay with us. Keep involved in the chat. Please remember to use the everyone tab at the bottom. Seems a bit strange, but otherwise we don't get all your comments. I'll be coming back in later on, but now I'll pass back over to Sally. Thanks a lot, Sally. Thanks, Eddie, for those warm-up questions, and thanks for answering those, letting us know where you are, what you're doing, and what superpower you would like. We had six people with superpowers, so I'd love to hear from all of you what they are. That's always good to know. Um, we're going to move on now, just, uh, just in relation to the audio issues that we had before. It seems to be that these are... Not everybody, just a few people are having some audio issues, which we think will be related to the WebEx servers. So please bear with us. If that happens to you, stay with us, because normally it corrects itself, and it seems that most people can hear us okay. So that's great, we'll, we'll carry on. Um, so I'm happy to bring in our first speaker this morning. Uh, Carlotta Fioretti is a research fellow at the European Commission's Joint Research Centre, and she's one of the co-authors of the handbook that this whole series is based on. And Carlotta is going to set the scene for us about the urban development network, about sustainable urban development generally, and then start to focus in on that particular chapter about integration uh, and set the scene for the speakers that are going to come with their own insights too. So over to you, Carlotta. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Sally. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Carlotta Fioretti, and uh, I am a research fellow uh, for the Joint Research Center. Today, I'm going to present to you the Handbook of Sustainable Urban Development Strategies. I will give you an overview about the handbook, and I will give you some details about one of these chapters that talks about cross-sectoral integration. Uh, the, the, this series of webinars is organized by the Urban Development Network, which is a network of more than 500 cities involved in sustainable urban development supported by the cohesion policy during this programming period and also the upcoming one. The webinars are also a collaboration between DG Rijo, the uh, Directorate General for Regional and Urban Policies of the European Commission, and the Joint Research Centre, uh, who together have worked in the last few years uh, to support, uh, to augment the knowledge on sustainable urban development and provide for methodological support. What are the objectives of these uh, webinar series? Well, first of all, the first objective is to augment our knowledge on how integrated strategies of sustainable urban development work. And how we will do that? Well, first, learning from the handbook. Secondly, listening to the direct experience of some practitioner. And today with us, we have some experience both from urban authorities and um, local authorities. And finally, exchanging comments and information among peers in the spirit of the UDN, of the Urban Development Network, and in a dialogue with the, the European Commission. So I invite you to use the chat to provide your comments and share your ideas uh, with us. Uh, what is uh, the handbook? Uh, well, first of all, it is important to say that the handbook is not a binding regulation, is not a binding guidance. Instead, it is a policy learning tool that helps uh, local authorities, managing authorities, more in general, all the stakeholders uh, involved in uh, uh, sustainable urban development. Uh, it helps them uh, to implement and design uh, integrated strategies. It refers to sustainable urban development as supported by the European Regional Development Fund during this programming period, but also the upcoming one. So you can use the handbook if you are planning to develop a strategy in the future programming period. The handbook tackles the most critical and recurrent issues faced by policymakers during the process of making a strategy. And it does so uh, through examples, good practices, providing data from this programming period, providing external resources, and a list of recommendations. I invite everyone to have a look at our web page where you can download the handbook and you can explore it. So, um, uh, here there is, a, let's say, a, um, a scheme, that a diagram that explains you uh, how uh, sustainable urban development strategies are conceived uh, within our handbook. They are conceived as a bridge between, on one side, operational programs, and on the other side, projects. That means that they are bridges between, on one side, the cohesion policy world, the European Structural and Investment Fund's architecture with its own rules and its own actors. Here, the main actor is, in, in fact, managing authorities that are uh, managing uh, operational programs. And on the other side, uh, the uh, local policy making board with its own actors, again, its own uh, strategic planning tradition uh, and its own skills. So the uh, handbook talks about both words, uh, and it talks about both type of actors. So for this reason, also today among our speakers, we have both managing authorities and local authorities. The, 
The handbook is structured around six building blocks that are the six main principles of the EU integrated approach to urban development. In fact, also the webinar series uh, mirror the structure and each webinar is dedicated to one of the uh, building blocks. Why I put this uh, uh, diagram with the, uh, the puzzle? Because, uh, in fact, this explains that uh, all the building blocks are inter interlinked uh, among themselves. And, in fact, the integration that is uh, uh, the, uh, the theme of today's webinar is something that is transversal uh, to all the different uh, principles. So, uh, for this reason, uh, when we talk, for example, about governance, it is very important to take into account integration am among uh, different levels of government and among different actors. When we talk about territorial focus, it's important to talk about the integration between uh, uh, different spatial levels, different areas. But today, the focus is on a cross-sectoral integration that means the integration between different policy areas. So let's go into uh, the, uh, the building block cross-sectoral integration. Uh, addressing cross-sectoral integration in SUD strategies, we aim first at a knowledge that there are multiple and interlinked uh, dimension of urban issues. Urban issues are complex and often the environmental, the economic, the social dimension are linked among themselves. So for this reason, it is really important to adopt a complementarity of action on different policy areas. And in order to do that, it is important to overcome the silos thinking that often characterize public administrations uh, and that, that reflect the division of function between departments and sectors. So to apply cross-sectoral integration means therefore to first ensure a coherence in principle and objectives among different existing policy areas. And secondly, collaborate among different departments across levels also to co-produce uh, policies. Here we have some uh, data from uh, the, the, the experience of the uh, almost 1,000 strategies implementing during this programming period. And what appears from the analysis is that, in fact, uh, uh, many, many strategies are uh, uh, doing integration across uh, uh, policy themes, uh, policy objectives. In particular, 27% of strategies integrate four different thematic objectives. And the most used one are TO4, local bone economy, TO6, environmental protection and resource efficiencies, and TO9, social inclusion. If we look then at the keywords, strategies integrate even more keywords, 60% using up to 10 different keywords. The handbook talks about cross-sectoral integration um, going into uh, the um, analysis of two specific issues. And let's see the first one. The first one is cross-sectoral integration within the cohesion policy structure. First of all, uh, this, it is important uh, to say that uh, uh, when you are uh, implementing uh, sustainable urban development strategies, you are often to deal with the existing conditionality and existing rules that are made by the European Commission and the national and the regional level. So sometimes you have only a few thematic objectives at your disposal to be used. This is called the thematic concentration. But still, it is possible to make integration with a few thematic objectives. And in order to do that, it is very important to create an enabling environment at all levels. So one of the challenges at this point is how to integrate teams at operational program level. First of all, uh, as a recommendation, 
uh, it is important to explore the possibilities made available by the cohesion policy itself. In particular, for what concerns the future programming period, the policy objective five, Europe closer to citizen, allow you to have a certain flexibility and to uh, put together different uh, uh, investment priorities. The, the, the second recommendation regards uh, uh, especially managing authority. They can plan cross-sectoral integration at an early stage of the funding process already during the drafting of operational programs. It is very important that the managing authorities encourage feedbacks from local authorities in order to avoid mismatch between top-down decision and local levels. And in particular about these two last recommendations, we will hear from the experience of the Tuscany region in Italy uh, in the, from the words of our speaker, uh, Alessandra De Renzi. The second issue at stake is cross-sectoral integration in territorial governance, meaning at the local level. So at local level, what is really important is to overcome existing sectoral barriers inside the local administration and to focus on, the, uh, on constructing a collaboration between actors and departments. In this way, it will be possible also to implement holistic strategies and cross-sectoral projects. The first challenge in the uh, territorial governance uh, uh, system is how to make different departments and offices working together. In the handbook, we have several recommendations uh, of, uh, let's say, structural nature, but also more flexible one. So in, from a structural viewpoint, it is possible to create offices um, or ad hoc committees to manage cross-sectoral policies in an interdepartmental way. Another kind of measure that it's more a kind of a soft measure is to organize lunchtime talks and periodic presentation on good collaboration practices. The city of Ghent uh, used both kind type of uh, measures, the structural and flexible, and uh, uh, Heidi Tensi will talk about it uh, later. The third, the last, sorry, the third and last challenge uh, is how to do cross-sectoral integration at the local level in the implementation phase. Again, there are several recommendations and in the handbook I want to pinpoint two. The first one, to invest in capacity building to enhance officials' understanding of cross-sectoral integration. This can be done in different ways and is very important the role of networks as the UDN, but also URBACT, and the, the possible role of experts. A second recommendation is to include a broad network of stakeholders throughout the policy process to overcome possible bottlenecks in, the, in, in implementing integrated policies. In fact, both measures are, uh, are used by the city of Alba Iulia in Romania, and uh, uh, later uh, Nikolai Moldovan will talk about this specific case. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any comments, you can write them in the chat, or if you want, you can write to my uh, personal email here in the slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlotta, for that um, introductory presentation. Um, we'll put in the chat some of the links to the handbook and to the previous sessions. That was really um, a great way to set up the rest of the conversation this morning. And some key messages in there about complexity, I think, that the way to solve complex urban challenges is really has to be a cross-sectoral approach, which involves collaboration between different departments of a city and, and many stakeholders in the city. And this is, we know, a challenging work uh, that, to, to do and to maintain that cross-sectoral approach, not just through designing projects, but through implementing them and keeping your stakeholders on board to help you do that. So we're going to hear a bit more about all of that through our presentations this morning. That was a great uh, food for thought already from Carlotta. Um, and I'll just add, please keep putting your questions and comments in the chat. 
Um, loving these superpowers that went in there. I like uh, one of them was to clone yourself to make sure that you ha were able to do all of the jobs around you. I think we'd all like that one. One was um, a superpower to have a good mood and energy for Zooms and, and digital meetings in the morning. Good for you. Glad, glad that you've joined us. And also um, that, that uh, one was that the, the superpowers of home working parents, which I think 2020 has tested all working parents to be able to keep going and uh, have with children around and, 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 and fights for the internet connection. I think our, our superpower that we would like as the UBN team would be to have the best possible connection and audio and no digital problems. I'm sorry that um, there seems to be some small number of issues with audio. They maybe have stabilized a little now. We don't have anything in the chat at the moment. I'm afraid when we can't actually fix that, it seems to be more like a local WebEx server problem. So please stay on board and stay with us if, if that's a, a difficulty for you. But now I'm going to hand back to Ed, the, uh, my co-moderator, to go through the next set of polls. Over to you, Ed. Thanks a lot, Sally. And um, thanks, Carlotta, for that really great um, scene setter. And uh, we'd love to go back out to the audience now just to, uh, with the second set of questions, just, just two questions this time. Um, these are a little bit more technical, but more focused on the theme of today's uh, webinar, um, looking at the question of integration and what integration means for us. Um, Carlotta described it as a puzzle where the pieces fit together. So um, let's pop up the first question, uh, Vasily. So there's quite a lot of words in this first question that might not fit in your chat box. So let me just um, talk through the, the very briefly. So um, this is about the different forms of integration. Um, and, and how relevant we think they are to our urban strategies and our project work. Um, we're not asking you to choose one. You can take as many of these as you think apply, the, all of the ones which you think are important. So the first one is this question of policy integration, this notion of um, combining social, e economic, environmental, so crossing this departmental silo problem that we sometimes have uh, and be able to get a holistic 360-degree um, approach. Second one is horizontal, making sure you've got all the local actors on board, uh, making sure all the different stakeholders who are relevant to the work are uh, involved in, 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 in the work, uh, something which Adele might talk about later on in terms of the airbag work. Um, the third one is vertical. Uh, we talked in our governance session about multi-level governance, so the national, the regional, the, uh, the city level. So again, this notion of vertical integration, um, how important is that? Funding we talk about in our next session, but funding and finance and combining the different streams is always part and parcel of the package. Uh, and the final one is territorial and a little bit of a link with the vertical one, but we talked about functional urban areas. We talked about the fact that the, 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 the administrative boundaries don't always fit exactly with uh, the way people lead their lives. So this notion of getting the scale right in terms of the, uh, the, the, the approach you have, and that would be different if you're looking at a mobility issue to if you're looking at um, a school issue. Um, so just tell us which of those is, is which of these are the most uh, relevant and important for you. You might take all five of them. If you think all five are equally important, there might be one or two which you think are uh, more helpful than the others. Let's go with the results. Okay, so wow, that's a nice even spread. So I think slightly above all the others is this cross-departmental issue, uh, working across the different policy, policy spheres, but it's a, it's, it's a really even spread there. So I think the key message for us is that all of these are important. Uh, as Sally said, that can make things complicated and complex, and we'll be hearing from our city case today, cases today about how um, we're going about tackling some of these issues and what works and maybe what doesn't work. So thanks a lot for um, sharing those with us. That's really, really helpful for us to hear. Um, Let's go to the second question. Uh, we talked a little bit there about challenges, and Carlotta picked up on challenges uh, in her presentation. Uh, let's think about barriers. Let's think about the things which might get in the way of us working uh, in an integrated way. Here are some of the barriers um, which we think are probably pretty common. There might be others. If there are others, then uh, please let us know. That's S at the bottom. Uh, again. Don't just choose one, choose as many of these as you think are relevant. Uh, I'll just briefly go through them. So an understanding of the concept, hopefully we'll demystify some of that today. Funding streams don't always make it easy. Um, collaboration between departments, silo working is 
um, something we are all pretty familiar with probably. Um, Carl also mentioned capacity building. Uh, sometimes this requires new ways of working. So again, uh, you know, maybe it's about the biggest barrier is the capabilities at the local level. Um, indicators in the final session, um, webinar six, we'll be looking at monitoring evaluation. Not always easy to get the right set of um, indicators uh, to, to measure progress across uh, an integrated uh, approach. So again, that can be a challenge. And then the final one is uh, others. So anything else you've bumped into or anything you else you think is an important barrier, and we haven't uh, we haven't uh, listed it there, then then please let us know uh, and pop your answers in the chat. So in so let's we take the uh, of the results. Yes. Well, let's take the last uh, ten seconds. Okay. In, in these sessions, we're trying to you know, condense these things as much as possible to use plain language. If we use terms that people don't understand or their acronyms, please uh, pick up on that and ask us because uh, that's uh, an important thing for us to do. So let's just have a look. So no answer 42%. Again, maybe that's because people aren't working directly on the front line on this. Um, C is the most common one, the lack of collaboration between departments. So this departmental silo problem, which I'm sure will crop up in the presentations this morning. Um, a shared understanding of the concept, still 30% of people saying that, and this is a, a recurring issue. So again, it's good to have that on the table, good for our speakers to know that, good for us to know that in terms of the UDN. Okay, but I think again, quite a balanced spread. I think all of the above is a key message. I think all of these are legitimate uh, barriers we're working, with, working against. So I'm going to stop there, Sally. I'm still looking at the uh, some of this unwillingness of central government to give a go for the local actors. So again, we might talk about that in some of the presentations today. Please keep your comments coming in the chat. We'd be pausing after this after the next presentation to bring some of your thoughts in. Uh, and now I'll hand back to you, Sally, to introduce our next speaker. Thanks a lot for that, Ed, and thanks for participating in the polls. It helps us to see what, what works for you and what the barriers are for you at local level. And we'll pick up that last comment as well, which was a part of the governance webinar about the, the collaboration between different levels of government, for instance, national and city level, which is important for incentivizing and supporting an integrated approach. So thanks for doing that. Um, sorry again, it seems like there are intermittent audio problems for some people, not for everybody. So please stay on board. There's nothing we can do about that. Our technical team is looking into it. It seems like it's a very localized either server or connection issue. So please uh, stay on board and, and uh, try and stay with us and follow the logic visually if we lose you briefly on audio, but tell us in the chat if that's happening too. Um, it seems that the connection issues have partly affected our lineup. So we're going to actually switch the order of our lineup now um, and before the break, we're going to take our first learning from practice from Nikolai Moldovan, who's going to tell us about his experience in Alba Iulia. And after the break, we'll come back to the Tuscany uh, regional uh, example. So, Nikolai, over to you to tell us about your um, experience in Alba Iulia. The floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Sally. Um, I would like to go directly to the slide number three. Yeah, um, this is uh, Alba Iulia, and uh, this is the other capital of Romania, a place which is a very uh, sy symbolic uh, one for Romania and for Romanians. Right now, I'm uh, working for the European Parliament. I'm a policy advisor for regional uh, development policy and for budget, and uh, I was the city manager of Alba Iulia municipality between 2012 and 2000, 2019, and previously I've uh, worked as a project manager and the chief of the communitarian project service inside the city hall, uh, writing and implementing different uh, projects in time, uh, mainly financed with the money from uh, European Commission, from national government, but also from other relevant stakeholders. The next slide, please. So, uh, Alba Iulia is a historic city with more than uh, 2,000 years of vivid history. It's the place uh, where Romania was born as a modern state uh, more than 100 years ago. 
uh, every year we are celebrating our national uh, day uh, on 1st of December due to the fact that uh, in 1918, at 1st of December, Romania was um, unified and um, Alba Iulia was the place where the official documents were, were signed. Um, is, uh, Alba Iulia is also a city which is having uh, the largest fortress from southeastern Europe, a fortress which is built on those more than two thousand years of uh, history is uh, a, a city uh, in the heart of uh, the famous region of Transylvania and also a small to medium sized city with no more than 74,000 uh, inhabitants right now according to the National Institute of uh, Statistics. Also, Alba Iulia is very important uh, for its uh, institutional uh, um, background, being a place where we are having two universities with almost 6,000 uh, students, which is uh, almost 8% of our total population, but also is the headquarter of uh, three very important regional institutions that are working with EU money um, at, the regional, uh, at the regional level. The next slide, please. In terms of uh, writing and implementing uh, at cross-sectorial level an uh, urban development strategy, uh, in our case, we decided to work on four different perspectives. The first one was to, to create uh, inside the city hall a team specialized in uh, uh, writing uh, uh, strategies and then in implementing, uh, in writing and implementing projects from uh, that strategy. Uh, it was very important uh, for us uh, in order to have uh, this team, uh, first of all, to have uh, uh, a visionary leadership uh, and also to have a strong political and administrative leadership expressed by the mayor uh, being uh, uh, in, uh, in position for uh, different mandates. We, in Alba Iulia, we had uh, a mayor uh, for six different ma uh, mandates, that means almost 25 years. And uh, uh, during uh, his mandates, we uh, elaborated the strategy, but also we had the chance to, to implement some of the most important projects inside the strategy. It's very important also to... to to have uh, the commitment and the openness of the, of the local council, of the local councillors towards uh, a strategic document and also towards the project inside uh, this uh, this document, and also, and very important, and uh, a strong uh, leadership and uh, coordination power expressed by a technical person. In in the case of Alba Iulia municipality, it was. It was me, uh, the person who had the chance to manage the process uh, for elaboration, the strategy, but also to uh, manage the process uh, in which some of our projects were uh, uh, written and then uh, implemented. The next slide, please. On the second dimension, we choose to work in, uh, uh, inside the city with the relevant institutions and uh, especially with the relevant local experts uh, from those uh, institutions. For us, it was very important to invite on board uh, the universities, the local network of NGOs, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, also the relevant companies inside the city, the creative hubs, and other, and, uh, other relevant uh, stakeholders, for example, those uh, working with um, Roma community, with uh, vulnerable groups uh, of, uh, of our municipality. And uh, also what I want to, to underline here is the fact that uh, um, we decided to work with the experts from the institutions, not with those coming in uh, our working groups for the elaboration of the strategy just to be present and to sign an attendance list and to confirm that an institution is uh, uh, on board. Now, we uh, uh, choose uh, the best uh, experts that the local institutions had in our city. The next slide, please. 
The third uh, pillar or the third dimension was to to invite uh, um, different international uh, institutions and uh, um, experts from from various uh, very prestigious international institutions to work in a small to medium sized city like uh, is the case of Alba Iulia. And uh, the first ones who were invited to work with us in 2015 uh, was uh, the the guys uh, the guys from the the, the World Bank? Alba Iulia was the first municipality in Romania signing a, a memorandum of understanding with the World Bank in order to to work um, for prioritizing uh, the most important investment projects from our strategy. Also, we uh, work uh, with uh, experts from European commissions from uh, different DGs uh, and also agencies. But also, uh, we were the first ones in uh, Romania inviting uh, the big guys from uh, Moody's Rating Agency to come in our city and to evaluate the first projects and the first investments made by us. Uh, and also to evaluate our uh, revenues policies and also the expenditures policies uh, for um, all the, the projects uh, financed from uh, from the strategy, but also from the the local uh, the local budget, of course. Also, we choose to to work in different thematic networks such as UDN. Um, and uh, uh, other uh, international uh, networks, European, but also international networks. Uh, and uh, we try to um, uh, valorize the very useful uh, lessons and uh, the very uh, rich experience from uh, uh, the networks that were financed uh, by European Commission inside uh, some uh, projects such as those financed through Urbac program or interact program. The next slide, please. The fourth dimension was to invite uh, relevant uh, experts uh, to work uh, on their uh, very rich background, professional background uh, in the city. Alba Iulia was the first city in Romania working with uh, Young Yale and Young Yale architects. Um, we uh, had a chapter inside our strategy which was evaluated by Young Gale and uh, it was a, ch a chapter dedicated to the quality of life in the most uh, used public space of uh, Alba Iulia municipality and I'm uh, meaning here uh, the, the Alba Iulia uh, Carolina, Alba Carolina fortress, so the largest fortress from Romania and from southeastern Europe. Also, we uh, work with um, uh, experts from, um, from um, World Bank, as Marcello Nescu Heroyu from different um, uh, branding uh, uh, companies such as our uh, steps, but also uh, urban uh, experts. Uh, and uh, we, we, we use them inside nine different projects in which Alberta municipality was a partner and right now is a leader in one uh, urban project uh, uh, financed by European Commission. And I want to, to underline here that um, Working with uh, these kind of, uh, uh, of experts was very, very useful for us. For our, uh, for our staff uh, uh, inside the, the, the city hall, but also for those um, from different local uh, institutions that had the chance to meet these guys and uh, 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 have the chance to learn from them, to hear their professional experience and also their very good advice for our uh, small city. The next slide, please. In uh, 2000, we had no more than 1 million euro in our local budget for investments. Um, so, um, a very limited budget in order to do a uh, huge transformation in the city and uh, to do uh, uh, development in a real sense of this uh, concept. So uh, we decided to, to to create inside the city a team of uh, um, specialized people in writing and implementing projects. Uh, after we prioritize them in uh, in our local strategy, then we uh, go to hunt sources and resources of uh, um, uh, money and also uh, expertise in order to uh, overcome the needs uh, from from our city and. Uh, um, 
after uh, after some years of uh, lots of efforts, uh, lots of work, we uh, succeed in attracting more than 350 million in the city from uh, different uh, non-reimbursable programs, most of them financed by European Union and international donors, but also from the national government and also from uh, a pri a private sector, meaning loans from banks, and also we issued bonds in order to support our um, uh, projects, uh, finance uh, our projects from the, the development strategy. So next slide, please. Uh, some key lessons from uh, the process, I think that is very important to underline the fact that it's always very important to work in partnership when you are uh, uh, elaborating and then implementing an urban development strategy. Also, it's very important to be transparent all the time, in all the phases, in all the parts of the process. It's very important to use relevant data and researches. That is why we try to involve uh, uh, on both sides, local uh, institutions, but also external institutions from the boundaries of our city. Um, a strategy without implementation is useless. It's very important to have uh, to have this document, uh, a vivid document, and not to have it uh, on a drawer or to walk with it on fancy conferences to present it. It's very important to present the results of your projects and the quality of, the, of your projects, also the satisfaction of your target groups. It's very uh, important all the time uh, to, to evaluate uh, what uh, you are doing, uh, in, in, uh, especially in the implementation phase. That is why we decided to work, and we had the chance to work for four times um, in four different years with the local university in order to um, uh, audit all, all, all our projects and uh, to, to, to see uh, the perception in the community, um, having the chance to, to create a, a communitarian barometer made by those from the university and evaluating the perceptions of those staying and living here in Alba Iulia. It's very important also to have a good, a very strong and a very open uh, relation with the managing authority uh, of those projects in which we are taking resources from public funds, especially those financed for, from the European uh, Commission. And also, what is also very important, and we are uh, doing this all the time, when we are uh, thinking uh, to a strategy, uh, to a special territory inside the strategy, we are always looking not only inside our city and inside our boundaries, but we are also uh, looking to the from the uh, urban function. Um, it's very important to and in a different level. Um, the level in which we are um, working more closely with our neighbors, because till now, due to the limits, due to the, um, uh, the fact that uh, we had a lot of work to do inside the, the community, we uh, didn't choose to work so much with our neighbors. But right now, it's very important to do this. It's very important because for the next period of allocation from the European Commission, a part of the money are um, addressing the special needs of uh, the metropolitan areas, but also those from the functional urban areas. And also, it's very important to have, to have very competent human resources that are uh, always looking uh, after the trends. Uh, they are uh, agile and also there. They have the guts to 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 do concrete things. They have to stay informed all the time and to look uh, after the resources which are very uh, well uh, uh, fitted in the in the local context in the local needs. And my last slide, please. Nicola, can you wrap up quite quickly now? We're just running out of time yeah. on this one, so just uh, a couple of words on this one. Thanks. Yeah, um, this is my last uh, my last slide anyway. Uh, so I want to uh, uh, to tell you all that uh, for the next period of allocation is very important that uh, uh, across the European Union and also in the member states, uh, uh, the 
policymakers, uh, both in terms of uh, European policymakers, national policymakers, and local policymakers, should uh, uh, consider the uh, urban development strategies as being a very important tool for the development of the local communities. And they should support uh, the elaboration of these uh, documents as being, uh, uh, I think, a Bible for the development of uh, especially small to medium-sized communities. Because more than 250 million Europeans are living in small to medium-sized cities, and it's very important to address the needs of these, of these people. And that, the, that is why, uh, for the next period of allocation, we should uh, look uh, uh, especially to, to, to this part of uh, Europe. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Nikolai, for that presentation. I think there's lots of really key points there and very practical advice for cities, which I really like. Um, thinking about leadership and commitment. I think Albi Yuli has had a really outward-looking approach, which is really interesting that you have brought in experts from all over the world and, and built the capacity of your colleagues that way. And I really like in that last slide when you said you need people to have the guts to do concrete things. It's actually about doing things as well. So thank yeah. you so much. We might have some questions for you in a minute. But right now, I'm going to turn to my, my great friend and colleague, Adele Buccella, who is Head of Projects and Programming at the Urbac Secretariat and our rapporteur today. So, Adele, you've been listening for a little while now to Carlotta and to Nikolai. Um, could you tell us what you take from this and what, what, what do you think is important for cross-sectoral integration? Thanks, Sally. Thanks for the introduction, and thank you very much to the JRC also for inviting me to uh, to join you today as a rapporteur. It's a, it's a great pleasure, um, and it's also a very great pleasure to hear about Alba Julia, and we'll come back to that, uh, which is one of my uh, my very favourite stories uh, in in terms of integrated approach. Um, yeah, I mean, working for the last 20 years with cities. This challenge of, of integration has always been there. It's a continuous, uh, a continuous challenge, I think, for cities. Um, and this, uh, the handbook is, uh, and along with the, the new Leipzig Charter, actually, are the kind of latest, if you like, developments in, uh, in this field. And um, what's quite interesting, I think, in the handbook um, and in some of the work that Urbact is doing, um, where I work. Um, it's more concrete, actually. We're seeing more examples of how to do it rather than just a theoretical kind of approach. Um, and I, I really welcome that in the, in the JRC uh, handbook. Um, quite interestingly, um, many of you have participated in the, in the previous sessions of these webinars. And in the very first one, we had a question in the chat about why the word integration or integrated wasn't in the title of sustainable urban development. And, and I thought that was a really interesting and pertinent um, question because clearly um, it's, uh, it, it should be. Uh, it's part of this, uh, the global picture, I think. Um, but what's important is the, the need to change mindsets, I think. And in Alba Julia, we've seen um, how, that was, uh, how that was done. It, it takes time, but... Um, it's something that I think is the, the key to uh, ensuring this cross-sectoral working. Um, it requires extra time, it requires extra effort, but perhaps you could consider it as a, as a short-term pain for a long-term gain. Um, and I think uh, perhaps what we've just heard from, from Nikolai is, uh, is, is really that, you know, a very um, intense investment for um, some extremely interesting rewards um, later on. So I'm pretty sure that nobody in the audience would be uh, contesting the importance of uh, working in an integrated approach. Um, maybe just a couple of words on this uh, question about um, implementation, because I think what we're seeing now is that cities that are more and more capable of designing uh, sustainable urban development strategies in a co-design uh, approach but co-delivery or, or implementa implementation um, in an integrated way is still, is still quite a challenge and I think quite new for, for many cities. And I think what we see, um, there's a, a part in the, in the JRC handbook about uh, continuing integration 
um, into the implementation. And um, we in Urbact have also done some work on that, which is referenced in the handbook. So I'll, you can take a look at that. But I think um, hearing from uh, Nikolai in, in Alba Lulia about how they managed to um, maintain and use their, their partners. And this, uh, this quote in the presentation that says that the strategy is for the city and not for the city hall, I think is really, is really key actually, because um, by designing proper structures for stakeholders um, and stakeholder involvement, um, and getting those stakeholders to take some responsibility for delivering is also um, really a, a very positive way to, um, let's say, um, maintain a more sustainable approach to, um, to some of the actions that are in many of the strategies. So um, perhaps that's an area that, uh, that cities should be focusing on now is this uh, co-delivery. Co uh, and then maybe a final word, um, just to uh, reiterate a little bit about uh, what was said about small and medium-sized cities. Um, clearly, one of, the, one of the things that we found actually in a recent study that we did last year in Urbact was that there's really um, a very different understanding of what integration is. Um, in cities, and sometimes it, it varies, um, not only because of the size of the city, but there was an interesting um, finding in our study about um, what integration means in small and medium-sized cities. Um, and I think the, the case of Alba Lulia that we've heard about, and I would really encourage you to visit because it's really an incredible place. Um, you, the use of branding, the use of setting yourself um, in an amb being ambitious, um, putting yourself in a position of, as a competitor for some of those big cities, not being frightened of the bigger, you know, the big guys, as uh, I think Nikolai said, um, is really a, a, an excellent piece of advice. And I'll stop there, and uh, we can all enjoy a nice, uh, a nice coffee break. I think. Thank you. Thanks, Adele. Not quite yet for the coffee break. So that was really um, important feedback on, on Alba Yulia's case and from the airbag perspective, what you know about integration and as, as well carrying integration through into delivery. It really quite difficult and, and hard. Um, but I'm going to bring Eddie in now to see if we've had any questions or comments in the chat and we'll take a break in about five minutes. Yeah. Any good questions? Yeah. Thanks, Sally. Yeah, lively discussion now on the chat, and I got a couple of questions for Nikolai. Actually, uh, I know we're about to break, so um, just just to kind of maybe some quick responses from Nikolai on, on these two things. The first one is someone saying, um, "Alba Yulia took a, a sort of very progressive, outward-looking, different kind of approach to to many other cities." So the first question is, where did that come from, and and what was behind that? And then I'll just tell you the second one, Nikolai, while you're processing. From the first, uh, from, um, let, me, let me just tell the second question. Yeah, uh, both together. The second question is about uh, this question about the, no, how we set out our uh, strategic priorities when we're not quite sure what resources we have. So, you know, we're making these plans in advance. You know, the, it's a cart and the horse. Which one comes first? So you talked about the spread of money. How do you, how do you kind of calculate your strategic priorities Without the full picture of resources in front of you, it's a very complex question. But if you just maybe give us some initial thoughts about that, it would be very helpful. Thanks. Okay, for the first uh, for the first uh, question, I think that the answer is on the fifth slide, um, um, and uh, the fact that uh, we started the process uh, some years ago. Um, being a city with uh, a courageous attitude towards um, um, uh, our needs, our problems, and also uh, being a city which really wants to do something and uh, to to find different ways to overcome our challenges. And uh, at that time, we created uh, inside the city hall the team uh, of those uh, knowing how to write and to implement uh, a strategy and uh, a project inside a strategy. 
And also at that time, we decided to work uh, with uh, different uh, stakeholders in the city in order to create two very important things. The first one, um, an administrative capacity at the city's level, and also uh, different channels to attract money in the city. So we decided to attract money uh, using the city hall, but also our partners from the universities, from the NGO sector, but also different relevant companies in order to overcome uh, some of the key issues that we confronted in the city at that time. Uh, in order to respond to the second question, it's very important uh, uh, to know that in our perspective, when you are writing a strategy, uh, first of all, you uh, have to be very keen to identify uh, the real needs that you are having in a community. And this is a, a very important process. When you are knowing very well your needs, then you could uh, create a very relevant vision and a very important strategic objectives for the development of your city. And then you are uh, going to hunt resources. So um, when we um, elaborating our uh, strategy, we, uh, uh, of course, we are not known at that time all the financing resources available for, uh, for, for our city. It was very important to know um, the, the typology of these kind of resources and the institutions that are able to finance the needs uh, of our city inside the strategy. And that is why we invited uh, in 2015 the guys from the World Bank to work with us in order to prioritize our investment projects. And to uh, create and to create inside the strategy different pillars of projects, and to decide that uh, this pillar is going to be financed by European Commission, this one by the national government, this one from um, private uh, private sector. Uh, we decided to took uh, different loans, and uh, even we decided to issue bonds. Uh, in order to to support some of our projects, so <clears throat> that was very important for us. Um, at a certain stage to work uh, with those from uh, for the World Bank in order to identify the proper tools in order to finance our projects. Thanks very much, Nikolai. Um, we could talk about this for a long time. We're about to run out of time. I can see Sally wanted to bring us to the break. Um, lots of other questions for you on the chat. So if you wouldn't mind just picking up on some of this, Nikolai, that'd be fantastic. We'll be talking about funding and finance in the next session, so please stay with us. This is the hot topic for you. Uh, I'm going to close my mic and hand back over to Sally. Thanks a lot, Sally. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you. Thanks for those questions, Ed, and thanks to Nikolai for your for your very comprehensive answers. As Eddie said, Nikolai, please take a look at the chat in the next 15 minutes because there's quite a lot of questions for you. If you could answer them there. And as Ed said, our next webinar, which is on Thursday this week, is about funding and financial integration. And I think Heidi might talk about that after the break as well. So thanks to everybody for that first really interesting session. We're going to take a five-minute break. We're going to come back at 11.12. Uh, so come back to hear the next two speakers, please, and to continue. Thanks a lot. Let's take a break. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to part two of this Urban Development Network webinar on cross-sectoral integration. Hope you had a break there, managed to have a stretch and a cup of coffee. We're going back into our program with two more speakers telling us about what they have done at regional and city level, and then taking your questions, listening to our rapporteur, and hearing from the European Commission about the future of structural funds with an integrated approach. So it's um, my pleasure, my great pleasure, to introduce now a colleague from the Tuscany Region Operational Program, Alessandra De Rensis, who's going to talk to us about what they have been doing over the last few years to encourage a cross-sectoral integrated approach in their operational program. So, Alessandra, over to you. The floor is yours. Okay, perfect. Um, just in case, let me know if you can hear me, because um, I think I'm losing connection here and there, but anyway. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Carlotta said at the beginning, uh, one of the main issues uh, for a managing authority when drafting operational program is often the issue of integration. Uh, so today I will try and present you our personal experience in Tuscany regarding these issues. 
Next, please. Uh, for what concerns the ROP ERDF, ROP in Tuscany, we have three kinds of horizontal strategies. Uh, one dedicated to urban areas, um, this is the main topic of my presentation of today. One dedicated to what they're called in Italy, inner areas, that means areas uh, far away in terms of travel time distance from provision centers. Um, service provision centers, and finally, the agenda for regional economic transformation that you all know called Smart Specialization Strategy. Um, these three strategies foreseen in the ROC are all multi-fund, or somehow they foresee ex ante, as I will say afterwards, complementary actions in other uh, cohesion policy funds, such as the ESF, as you can see here, key funds. Such as the ESS you can see here. Uh, next, please. What we're going to do uh, these three uh, horizontal ones. Um, in 2015, the regional administration launches two core for interested. Uh, each one of them, one for open access and the other one for, as we said, the inner area strategies. Uh, both of them share some specific features that uh, you can find throughout the Toscany planning system. First of all, we publish a public procedure setting the general principle of eligibility as well as clarifying the rules foreseen by the ROC. The most important thing is both calls sort of state exante um, the definition of a governance and the various level of responsibility so as to have a smooth share planning of operation. At the end um, the, of the, the course, there was foreseen a, a program agreement so as to uh, subsidize, um, substantiate, sorry, the uh, subsidiarity principle and in a, in a logic of horizontal subsidiarity. Next, please. What were the selection criteria of the Sustainable Urban Development Strategy for the ROP uh, in Tuscany. Um, first of all, what we as we said so at the beginning, what we want to select urban innovation projects. To do so, we actually looked at the size of entity of the participatory process behind the proposals, uh, so as to see how much these ideas were shared with local stakeholders. And as well, we uh, looked how the strategy were able to address the extent to identify critical social economic features of this territory and how sustainable and profitable were the interventions. We also set some um, principle behind the choice of action that these strategies could um, embrace. 70% uh, of intervention had to relate to thematic objective 9, whereas the remaining 30 to thematic objective 4 as context interventions. But above all, what we looked for was the ability of these strategies and especially these projects to be integrated and coherent with other national, European, regional and local policy and planning instruments, as well as the synergy and complementarity with that action of the ERDF group and of the ESF. Next, please. So what kind of actions uh, where did the, the regional authority for so for urban strategies? As we said, the majority of the action related to thematic objective nine. So here, as you can see, um, in about uh, provisions and public services provisions, such as educational health, the recovery of buildings for public purposes. And in for what concerns thematic objective four. Um, supporting um, interventions such as the eco-efficiency of buildings, smart grids, and sustainable mobility. Please notice on your left-hand side that I put an arrow to indicate that some of these interventions found complementary actions in the ROC ESS. Next, please. So, what were we looking for with this call for interest? Something like this. 
uh, this is a project brought forward by one of the municipalities. The shape that you see in the middle of this plan is actually the area where the sustainable urban development strategy is placed. The other dots that you see are other interventions supported by national, regional, uh, European, local um, resources. So you see, we were looking for something like um, an overall strategy for the territory, not just a single set of intervention. Um, so this is what we're looking for. Next, please. So how did it all went about? Um, the approval for the two-step approach. First of all, an initial assessment by an evaluation committee composed of the regional offices uh, responsible for the actions of the regional operational program. There was the involvement of the managing authority of the directorate uh, coordinating the urban access, as well as the support of our regional research institute for the assessment of the economic, operational feasibility and viability of operation, as well as other regional offices responsible for environmental issues and strategic planning in general. Those um, proposals that actually passed this uh, first initial assessment were admitted to what we call the co-design process, meaning that the regional offices, uh, the managing authority, as you said, the coordinator of the urban access, together with both the um, urban authorities, um, set all the details of the actions, sort of like trying to uh, prevent possible bottlenecks in the future and work together. Next, please. Uh, this is um, a simple overview of the organizational chart of Toscany. I just wanted to show you because the, um, the box highlights it are the director general, general that are involved in the design, managing, and monitoring of the sustainable urban development strategies. So as you see, quite uh, a lot of them are actually involved into following both urban authorities as well as beneficiaries in the implementation of projects. Next, please. So well, we call that a diffused managing authority um, in the sense that we shared responsibility, first of all, with other regional offices, so as to guarantee an horizontal integration, again, both at regional level, so as the, the offices could have an idea of what was up, up, happening on the territory, but at the same time helping the local authorities to find complementary and synergic intervention on the same policy. Uh, this was done uh, specifically by um, placing um, a, a criteria in the course for interest to go beyond the simple support provided by the RDS. But above all, the creation of a long lasting network of support between the regional offices, the urban authorities, and the beneficiaries, stimulating, um, as we um, tell each other all the time, mutual appraisal and capacity building. Next, please. I would like to conclude with a couple of take home messages. Um, the first one regards in general that, in my opinion, local sustainable development, if they want to embrace what is called the Nexus approach, should adopt an integrated multidisciplinary approach, sharing with local communities the best way to satisfy the needs. At the same time, I think that integration to be effective has to rely on two main principles. First of all, subsidiarity. Maybe for Toscany it is quite easy because we have a very long tradition dating back to 2007 about involving local authorities, local stakeholders in the design policies. But sometimes it could be useful and that what we um, share with our um, beneficiaries was timing. Placing this provision ex ante in programming judgment gives them already the idea of where this project should um, go to and what they should aim at. Next, please. 
One important thing that, uh, we uh, think uh, is that this kind of integration between offices, uh, policies, uh, local authorities, local beneficiaries, it's something that should not stop at the design phase of urban strategies or territorial strategies in general. They have to continue also during the monitoring and evaluation. For this reason, uh, we entrusted local coordinators, uh, urban authorities or local technical coordinators, depending on the type of uh, strategy, to supervise the overall coordination and monitoring of each strategy as well as being responsible for information, communication activities, monitoring, and supporting the managing authority and the coordinator of the uh, urban access also in evaluation. Moreover, we set up a technical monitoring committee made basically the same committee um, members of the evaluation phase, as well as a political college of supervisors uh, made up of the representatives from the regional government and the lead mayor of the municipalities involved. Next, please. Just to conclude, uh, looking ahead, the most important thing is that we think that uh, this kind of experiences should be replicated also in the next programming period, 2021-2027. Uh, we think that we're developing urban areas leveraging on the uh, capabilities of these territories, on their environmental, um, cultural resources are fundamental to make our neighborhoods, even in small and medium-sized cities, more livable, safe, and attractive, socially and economically more viable. In Tuscany, this is already in our regional lab, uh, where we um, say that sustainable urban development should be achieved by means of integrated disciplinary systems, which identifies that in urban regeneration the fundamental action, integrated and multidisciplinary. Thank you very much. This is my last slide. Um, please feel free um, to ask me any question, and I hope you manage to hear everything because we have been having problems with connection. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alessandra. It's a shame we couldn't see you, but we could hear you fine. So thank you for taking us through those slides about your own um, experience in, in Tuscany with the regional operational program. Um, I think it was really interesting to hear about the innovative approach, the co-design approach, but also um, that it, it emphasizes how structures and processes at regional level within the operational program, although they're quite technical, are really important to setting up the sustainability and the integration at local level. So thank you so much for that. If people have questions for Alessandra, please feel free to put them in the chat bar. We also posted in the chat bar a link to a film uh, from, from Tuscany, which is a really nice film showing what they have done at local level through their um, sustainable urban development strategy. So please take a look at that. But as Eddie said, not right now. Wait till we finish the webinar and, and we'll, we'll make sure you have that link. Um, we're going to be possibly running over a little with this webinar, partly to do the technical issues. We will be finished by 12.15 latest Central European time. Uh, so please stay with us to make sure that we have enough time for our, our speakers on the conversation going forward. So um, I'm now going to introduce our third speaker, who is from the city of Ghent in Belgium, Heidi Tensi. Welcome, Heidi, and thanks for joining us. And Heidi is going to talk to us about how the city organizes itself internally to make sure there is integration across departments and projects. So over to you, Heidi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to share our, our experience on cross-sectoral uh, integration. Um, as you can see, I will focus on, on how we integrated on management and project level uh, in Ghent. Next slide, please. Um, these are the topics of my presentation, um, um, so that you have an overview of what's coming. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, first of all, a few words about uh, Ghent. It is located at the northern part of Belgium, and it's the third city of our country. 
Um, the city is divided into 25 neighborhoods in order to carry out an area specific approach and policy participation. And also worth mentioning is uh, North Sea Port, that's uh, uh, the cross border port area at the Dutch uh, uh, border. Um, next slide, please. Um, I wanted to show our mission, uh, not to. I'm not going to, to into detail in it, uh, but I wanted to show it because it's it's for us it's a compass for policy. We are aligning our uh, urban strategy, and the mission also reflects the way we are organizing ourselves in Ghent. We are an open city. We want to co-create with citizens and organizations. Heidi, can I just uh, ask you to turn your camera city, off because we have some audio issues? Thank you. Ah, okay. Okay, yes, go I ahead, Heidi. We can hear you now. I think it's a local connection issue, so maybe we share your slides again, and we'll let yes, you know if we can yes. hear you. Go ahead. Uh, yes, and maybe uh, uh, the next slide. It's about our organization model. Um, this is a picture that we showed to new colleagues instead of the, the real and rather complex uh, organization chart. Um, you can see on the top that we have six thematic departments and at the bottom uh, in, in the graph, uh, the four supporting uh, departments from which uh, the, man the management is uh, one of it. So it, there is a bottom up support towards the thematic uh, departments. Uh, Again, wants to be an, ag an agile organization. So that means that we make adjustments in our organization and daily operation if, if needed. And that can uh, perhaps result in an adapted organization uh, charge. Um, on the next slide, um, I will tell you more about uh, the department, the management uh, department. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the management, uh, the cross-sector integration and the strategic planning is embedded in the management uh, department. It's headed by the general manager of the city, and one of its subdivisions is strategy and organization. Um, led by a strategic coordinator. In fact, that is the strategic heart of our organization. And as you can see, the strategic funding is also part of it. Uh, I will come back later on this, uh, on this service. Um, and you can see participation, strategic coordination is, is uh, so it's really the strategic heart of our uh, organization. I will now illustrate some examples of uh, how uh, we organize cross-sectoral integration on management level. Um, one is the lunch keynote. It's uh, on, a, on a certain cross-sectoral uh, topic. The main purpose is knowledge sharing and internal networking. It often starts with a lunch. Uh, so the informal contact is for us as important as uh, sharing uh, the knowledge. knowledge. This is an example of uh, the keynote on the Green Deal. And the question was, what's in it for Ghent? What's in it for my department? What's in it for me? Another example on the next slide is the uh, intranet groups. These are open groups on common topics. Um, every interested colleague can join these groups. We, we, we created, for instance, a group on the digital agenda where we share our mission, vision, strategy, in an easy, accessible way to our, our, the different colleagues. And, and a third example on the next slide is a, a cross-sectoral working group. Uh, such a group meets regularly and has a closed intranet page to share information and uh, documents. Uh, the, the example that I'm showing is uh, from the working group, which is called Together Circular. It was a bottom-up initiative of uh, departments who felt the need to work together on an integrated circular uh, strategy. Um, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> now I'm going to tell you a bit about how we uh, uh, work across sectoral in, in um, funding. As I mentioned before, funding is part of the, the management department. Uh, the, the, our name is strategic funding, what means that we are only dealing with uh, the, the funding managed programs relevant for a wide range 
of city services and covering various uh, policy domains of European national uh, funding. So we are not really in charge of sector specific funding programs because we believe that departments are, are better place uh, to apply for. Um, the, the blue circle um, shows projects that are planned in the multi-annual strategic planning. Uh, it's planned and there is also budget. And we can, um, uh, the projects could be accelerated, scaled up, enhanced, or made more sustain, sustainable by extra funding. So we have a budget available in the strategic plan and we are looking for extra funding. That's the blue circle. The green circle, um, these are new um, uh, project IDs uh, uh, based on strategic choices. There is some budget available um, in the strategic plan, but uh, sometimes we want to experiment more uh, looking for innovative solutions. Uh, but uh, all the projects that we are doing are connected in one way to another with the strategic uh, plan. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as I said, we have a, a, spe a specific office for strategic uh, funding. It's a, it's a knowledge center for funding, uh, developing and rewriting of proposals, budgeting, partner search, and it is staffed with funding managers and financial experts. We, we provide a tailor-made support uh, depending on the experience and needs of the involved departments, but in cross-sectoral initiatives, there is always an active cooperation between the strategic funding and the involved uh, departments. Uh, we are also a matchmaker between the funding opportunity and our strategic uh, priorities. Each uh, funding manager is uh, specializing in, in one or more policy teams and is a stock for other departments. And of course, networking is very uh, important. Um, now I will illustrate uh, some examples uh, of ERDF funded projects and how we um, cooperate over, uh, within the different uh, departments. The first example is about urban renewal. Uh, the, um, for complex urban development projects, we can appeal to SOGAN. SOGAN is our urban development companies and have a lot of experience and knowledge of managing such complex projects. A part of their complexity, these projects are most of the time a high financial investment. So there we try to combine different public funding sources and private investments as well. For the, the example here, Winter Circus, there is a PPF construction for the exploitation. Another example um, of your defunded uh, project is ICARUS, funded by UIA. Um, in, in that program, you can only apply with one pro, uh, pro project. So we, we la uh, launch an internal call for proposals and assess these proposals to the criteria of the call in order to apply with the most strategic and promising project. And as you can see, we, we all also co cooperate with external organization because we believe that um, uh, external organization can also contribute to the implementation of our strategy. So cross-sectoral integration uh, is for us uh, also taking advantage of the existing ecosystem in our um, city. Uh, and a third example on the next slide is a, a bottom-up approach. Uh, the Plaisance character is a renovation of a church into a multifunctional space. Um, as you probably know, Ghent has a long tradition of policy participation. We really want to co create with the citizens or neighborhood managers or, or networkers in the neighborhoods. They do not only inform, but also catch its IDs. And in um, ERDF Flanders program, we have a specific role we can support also external organization in getting ERDF funding. Uh, that makes it possible that we can also rely on smaller bottom-up projects in the neighborhoods of which the Plaisant Kerk is uh, one example. So therefore, we are very proud that, one of, uh, that this project was finalist in the, the Regional Stars uh, Awards. And then I come to my last slide. 
some lessons learned of, of what we find important in Ghent is that the organization model is a way to structure your organization, but not more than that. It's more about collabor collaboration between people, listen to ideas, their concerns, needs of colleagues, talk to each other, bringing together colleagues with the same ideas and mindset. So the informal contact is very important. Uh, a second one is the best promotion for cross-sectoral integration is having some good inspiring examples and enthusiastic colleagues in the different departments. When that, start, uh, when that is available, then you can start working more bottom up in, instead of uh, top down. Uh, also very important, you see, um, I mentioned our mission uh, and our strategy. And that is uh, for us is that the guiding compass to prioritize our participation in EU funded uh, project. And the last one, I hope that I, I could show with, with uh, the examples that there is not only one way for cross sectoral cooperation, but many different ways to cooperate. Uh, sometimes it's trial and error to see what works or uh, not. So that was my last slide. I hope that there were not too many troubles with the sound and that you enjoyed uh, listening to it. Uh, in, in any case, thanks for your in attention. And if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask me. Heidi, thank you so much. We had a slight bump at the beginning, but we heard you really loud and clear for all the rest of the presentation. So thank you for that. Thank you for the slides. And I really appreciate how practical a lot of those ideas are and ideas that other cities can pick up and run with. And as you say in that last slide, multiple ways to do cross-sector integration, uh, lots of different uh, structures and systems and processes that you use in your city. But the, the, the overall, it's about connecting people, improving the connectivity between colleagues, departments, and listening, listening to each other and to your citizens and your citizen groups. So there were some great um, examples there. Thank you so much for sharing those with us. So those were our three um, insights and city cases and, and regional case. We're now going to go into a little more debate in plenary. So I'm going to bring back in our rapporteur, Adele Buccella, for her reactions. And I'm also then going to ask Eddie to bring in the questions that are happening in the chat. Lots going on in the chat. That's great. So first we'll listen to Adele and then ask Eddie to bring in some, some questions from the chat. Adele, um, what, do you, what did you find interesting in those last two presentations? And how, how do they connect to the core principles of cross-sectoral integration? Yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff, isn't there, in, the, yeah. in these cases, actually. So it's really difficult to uh, to pull out the the key the key points. But maybe maybe to come back to what we heard this morning from Carlotta about this idea of um, moving away from the silo thinking. And I think the last two presentations both um, demonstrated very well how to do that practically, like you say, in, in very concrete lessons. Um, ironically, some of the things that are uh, happening at, at European level still remain in these in this silo in these silos. So the, um, for example, the urban agenda for the EU is, is still organised in these uh, thematic um, thematic way, and, and actually. Uh, it's still challenging, I think, even at that level, to to deal with these cross uh, um, cross cutting uh, actions and and making those links. Um, we also heard um, the the fact that it's hugely important the the role of the national regional authorities in establishing the right framework for this to actually work because. Sometimes, I think uh, my own experience of having worked in a city, um, you find that your hands are tied, actually, due to the framework that you're forced to uh, to work in, and which is often incompatible with some of these um, principles of, uh, of cross-sectoral integration. And that's where I think the example from Tuscany, um, for me, was really, really interesting and quite rare. I mean, perhaps I'm uh, uh, less connected with the managing authority world as I, as I used to be, but um, uh, those examples from Tuscany in terms of how to uh, really focus on um, setting the right context to allow this co-design um, and the fact that it actually continues into um, monitoring and implementation 
um, and evaluation, and that the cities and the regions uh, in their operational programs are actually accompanied um, throughout the whole process. And um, maybe, maybe one of the interesting things um, for me in the presentation from uh, Alessandro was um, uh, the use of the multi funds. So how to make that um, integration between the ESF and ERDF funding and ensuring this is a, again another tool I think for improving um, the integrated approach uh, at, at that level. Perhaps just a quick word about um, what we heard from Ghent because again, what struck me um, in all three presentations actually is um, you know the importance of um, the governance model, the organisational models, um, and there were so many similarities from what we heard in, in the way that um, Ghent and Alba Iulia have set up um, these strategic departments, the departments that actually have a responsibility for having an eye on absolutely everything. Um, and this, I think, is, a, is, is really for me a, a key to a key to success. And it's not only in these two cases that, um, in my experience, I, I've seen many other cases like that. Um, and I really think things like the organisational chart that Heidi presented to us, really simple tools, but so um, speak so loudly actually to how the integrated approach can be. Um, very simply presented um, uh, to uh, to new recruits, um, and it sets them it sets the right mindset for for those new recruits. Um, and the idea of having an internal call for proposals um, to to allow the different departments to pitch, um, and the the philosophy of um, not a non-competitive departmental working, which. Uh, which I think for maybe many of our people in the audience will be uh, will be a novelty, um, and I'm really I would be really interested to hear some more from that uh, from Heidi, and then maybe just a final a final word from um, what I've, everything that I've heard this morning. Um, I think to conclude, successful integrated um, sustainable urban development strategies and action plans are all about people actually. Um, and in Ghent, in Alba Iulia, and in Tuscany, we heard that there were ambassadors leading this process, that there was political will, um, and these people are the ones that push that forward. Um, so perhaps my final comment to, uh, to the audience today would be to um, think about who your ambassadors are um, and use them, use them well if you can. Thanks so much, Adele, for some really great insights there and some of the commonalities that we've seen across the presentations this morning. And also putting people, you know, this role of, of your key people, building the capacity of those people and allowing them to, to go and do that work of connecting people, listening and, and being an ambassador for integration in, in your city or your region. So thanks so much. Um, thanks, Adele. So I'm going to hand over to Eddie shortly. Eddie, do we have any questions from the chat that you'd like to bring in at this point? Yeah, we've got really lively chat discussion going on. Thanks to Nikolai for picking up some of those earlier questions. We've got some questions for Heidi and for Alessandra and a couple of general questions. I, I think what we'll do, Sally, is maybe just have one question for Heidi, maybe one for Alessandra, and then maybe Carlotta might pick up the other one, which is a kind of more generic question. Um, the first one picks up on the Heidi question, picks up on something which Adele just talked about, was this whole thing about how we get to work across silos. Um, and the question for Heidi, which was, which was from uh, Maria Rao, uh, one of our Urbach colleagues, in fact, was um, how do you deal with this, this resistance and fear factor of people who are comfortable in those little departmental boxes and who don't like the idea of kind of lifting the lid and working in this more integrated kind of way? A any hints and tips for colleagues across Europe who are maybe kind of struggling with that challenge, Heidi? Uh, yes, I have to say that we I didn't mention it, but we started uh, by the early years of 2000 with the reorganization of uh, the departments. So yeah, it, it took some time to overcome the resistance at uh, certain uh, departments. But um, yeah, we we we, uh, we tried and uh, um, just tried, and the informal contact is very important because. 
Then you, um, sometimes there is this, uh, resistance at management level in a department, and if you can talk to people in a more informal way, to colleagues that maybe that you feel they are interested to cooperate, uh, then maybe you can convince them or give practical examples. What I mostly do is if we if there is a, a call, then um, I already start thinking who can I involve, which department is relevant, and most of the time it's there is no we don't have a, a real roadmap on how involving the departments, but it's it's, it's growing more or uh, in, in an organic way. So I think who can I contact? and who can join the project. And sometimes it's uh, um, at the management level some resistance, but once they see that it works, um, the resistance is, is already yeah, is, is less than, than at the, the beginning. So therefore, what I mentioned at the end, ambassadors, what I also said, ambassadors in, within the department are very important. Thanks a lot, Heidi. And then we're hearing some of those kind of key words around those informal links, that sort of be comfortable out of your comfort zone, that kind of where things become a bit movable and shifting and fluid. So, uh, you know, people who are, who are who operate well in those situations are, are more comfortable in, in, in those kind of less clear settings. So good things there. And also thanks for connecting with what Adele said, which is also very helpful on this theme. Um, and let's just move to Alessandra's presentation now. Lots of things in there and uh, yeah, a few questions on the chat, but I guess the specific one, Alessandra, which um, might be useful for us to talk about here is this this this, this um, evaluation committee, I think you called it CTV, I think it was, mm -hmm. was the acronym. Uh, and Nora Teller asked us on the, on the chat, um, just where did the driver for that come from? Was it imposed nationally? Was it something you designed yourselves internally at a regional level? This, Tell us a little bit about the background to that, where the, where the idea for the concept came from. Well, um, I'm sorry, can you hear me properly? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay. Sorry. Um, well, the funny thing is when I heard Adele talking about how um, weird she found what we're doing, I, I thought about myself when we were writing the handbook. The, the, my answer the, most of the time to our colleagues was, why don't you do it? This is so normal for Tuscany. Um, as I said, one uh, one of the, my, my last slides, this, this is so embedded into Tuscany way of doing that it's just normal for us. Um, so there's no, actually no provisions. Obviously, there, there were provision in the call for proposal for call for interest, but it's not something that is derived from an, an obligation for the access. It's something that we usually do. In Tuscany, uh, first of all, because we think that Adele used the word elective very much because I, I noticed, I put it down before she actually said it, is accompany beneficiaries throughout the implementation and, as I said, monitoring and evaluation by means of having our colleagues actually responsible for uh, implementing those policies, regional policies, every day. So, so as a beneficiary could have exactly the, the person in charge and could help them in overcoming problems, um, avoiding possible bottlenecks, or preventing the, 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 them to come about. So this is in gen as, that's why I, I started my presentation uh, showing you the three um, multi-sectoral uh, strategies that we have in uh, our ROP areas. Because this is how we do it normally. So it doesn't matter what kind of territory, in this case, being urban, rural, or in the case of um, regional economic transformation, that is smart digitalization, we usually have this kind of um, groups of regional colleagues working together and trying to find synergies, complementarities, and accompanying beneficiaries into that. Okay, thanks, Alessandra. I mean, a couple of key things you said there. One was, you know, um, this is normal for us. So Europe is super diverse. So what we thought, one of the great things of being exposed to other places, you see that what's normal for us is not always normal for other people. So I think that's, uh, you know, a, a, a core kind of concept within these within these webinars. And another is that things take time, and that's been a recurring theme through all of these webinars. That you know, these these are these are iterative processes which we build on. 
um, year on year out. Um, and conscious of time, Sally, but I just want to just ping a final question um, to Carlotta, if I can bring Carlotta in. We had a really great question earlier, Carlotta, from uh, Luca Lanzone, who's again someone in the Arabic community who who asked, who raised this issue of the, the, the 15 minute city concept, this relatively new idea where everything is within 15 minutes, the place where we live, where we work, where we uh, where we socialize, is a 15 minutes journey from 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 our kind of home location. So, um, you know, it's, it's transformative in terms of the, the the green agenda, but has big implications for the way we work um, in an integrated way. We could have a half day seminar on this. We don't have time just now, but maybe a couple of headline thoughts from you, and then I'll pass back to Sally just to to begin to wrap things up. Yeah, what I think that uh, it was uh, really interesting from the comment, uh, it was that he, he put uh, uh, side by side the 15 minutes uh, areas with the 15 years uh, uh, vision, let's say. And uh, it, it, I think that uh, we, we, we should uh, think about the other dimension, in fact, of, uh, of the EU approach to sustainable urban development, because what I, 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 I saw in many strategies across Europe, for example, in France, uh, with the case of Toulon, but also in Italy, with the case of Reggio Emilia, is that it is possible to have uh, uh, two different speeds at the same time, um, making a wider strategy with the long-term objectives that sometimes concern the entire city or even the functional urban area and then implement it through action plans that are much more integrated at the level of district. So individuating, uh, uh, let's say, priority areas that often are these 15 minutes uh, areas and uh, uh, implement in concrete ways integration through action plans. So uh, for this reason, it calls a little bit the other dimension I said of uh, the integrated approach because it means working in a strategic way but also individuating the appropriate territorial focus uh, for your strategy. Thanks a lot, Carlotta, and very succinct response. That was brilliant. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sally, and back over to you. Thanks, Ed, and thanks everybody for those questions and comments in the chat, which are really enriching the conversation here and for the responses we've had. The 15-minute city is part of the recovery plans for many cities, a sort of forward-thinking strategies post-COVID, too, in terms of the recovery. So we're going to now go a little bit more into the future, thinking about what this all means in terms of the new programming period for structural funds. And I'm going to bring in Laura Liget, who's our colleague from the European Commission, DG Regio, to help us think about this and connect what we've heard this morning to the, the looking ahead agenda to the next program period. So Laura, um, tell me, what, what have you heard this morning that you think it's important to build on for the next program period? Um, well, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well and see me uh, as well. Uh, we can. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, well, uh, one of the very key points that I heard, of course, is that uh, we are putting the emphasis uh, on the, the diversity of all the approaches that are possible and that, of course, there is no uh, solution that fits uh, all territories. And this is really underlining once more the meaning of what we propose through cohesion policy, which is uh, to have uh, place-based uh, strategies. And this is really uh, something probably that you have discussed also in the in the first webinar on strategies. But once more, uh, this is of course a very uh, key point that uh, that we need to to underline uh, again. Uh, another one was of course that um, integration is a, is a very key concept for cohesion policy. But as we see, it's reflected through so many parameters. Actually, it's really not uh, a one uh, type of uh, concept that we can. Uh, uh, think about um, in one way. It's really about uh, the coherence uh, in the policy making, the alignment and the correlation between the, the priorities, the objectives, and also um, the time frames uh, that we have of and the, the, the consideration of interactions between the different objectives. So this is really a very important notion. And, uh, and of course, uh, what we've heard also is very, is very key concept in terms of the governance and to really have this uh, collaborative approach uh, between the different levels of governance, but also uh, within one uh, city or um, uh, territorial authority between the different services. And we have so many uh, uh, good examples that we had this morning. So this is really um, very, very keen in, in terms of uh, cohesion policy. And uh, a, a key point also is to have a shared understanding. And I thought it was a really important uh, concept there. Thank you, Laura. Um, 
Thanks, Laura. Um, so today we focused on um, the current period of, of structural funds and the examples have come clearly from, from the last few years. Um, can you tell us, will there be changes in, in the future in sustainable urban development policy and in particular in relation to cross-sectoral integration? Um, well, uh, of course, this is, this is a new period that will be starting soon. Uh, in terms of the changes, we can say that there are no major changes that will completely change the policy, but of course there are there are some new options uh, that will be uh, that will be proposed uh, in the in the in the policy itself. So for for of course we have uh, we have really uh, maintained this approach of working uh, at all levels, so not only um, at the national or regional level, and this is really something that is in the continuity of what we have in this current period to uh, actually reinforce the, the territorial and urban dimension of the policy really uh, what is about uh, the sub-regional level. So there is still this, um, this uh, sustainable urban uh, development dimension that is really uh, strong uh, in the policy. We have uh, also um, modified a little bit the, the options in terms of the, the objectives. So we had, uh, we had a high number of, of thematic objectives. Now we are a bit limited a bit down in terms of uh, the policy objectives that we propose now, there are only five, but actually the thematic coverage is still, um, is still important and we have a brand new policy objective, uh, number five actually, a Europe closer to citizens, which is uh, entirely dedicated to this um, urban and territorial development, promoting the integrated uh, approaches and the cross-sectoral integration of various uh, intervention fields. So this is really a key point there, which um, we propose under this objective, which is really horizontal and which allows to mix actually the different uh, investment priorities from all the other uh, policy objectives. So a smarter Europe, greener Europe, more connected, more social Europe. So this is a this is the this new addition that we have now, and also. Uh, there can be uh, as well uh, investment in terms of security and culture uh, under this uh, specific job objective. So really, the idea is to have this mix uh, of intervention, which is possible uh, under under this one. And um, there are um, a few conditions, which are actually to have uh, the old interventions based on the on the integrated place-based strategy, and also that the the local authorities, the relevant uh, bodies have to be uh, involved in the selection of operations. So this is really once again about uh, multi-level governance. Um, otherwise, in terms of, of the tools, we have continued the, the existing ones, so the, the ITI, the CLND, and now we are also allowing to have other types of uh, territorial tools that are already possibly existing at the national level or the regional or below the regional level as well, so that we can allow actually for the continuity of certain practices that are already uh, efficient and that, that fits the local context. So this is the, the whole idea. And then um, with regard to, um, to sustainable urban development, we already had a uh, 5% of the, the national uh, allocation for ARDF allocated to urban development, but now it's, uh, it's up to six, and now even 8% uh, are still under discussion. So this is also a reinforced uh, dimension. And we also wish to insist uh, on putting a greater focus on the on functional urban areas, and we think this is really an important uh, notion uh, to really try to tackle some challenges that are not limited to the administrative boundaries, and really this is something that we uh, we are trying to promote more and more. And, uh, and the last uh, point for this question is actually about um, the, the technical assistance and the, the capacity building that we are also offering to cities and uh, local authorities, so um, we have launched uh, now uh, the process to start a new uh, initiative, which is the European Urban Initiative, which is actually also in the continuity of what we have proposed so far, and um, trying to support cities in terms of capacity building knowledge uh, and uh, innovative solutions. So this is uh, more or less the landscape for, for the new period. Thanks, Laura. There's a lot of trends there that you've, you've told us about and informed us about the way it's, it's moving in terms of policy, so thanks for that. So just my last question to you really is that we have on board managing authorities and ministries and people working at city level. So what's your advice to them about how to prepare for the future and how to keep up to date with these trends and developments? 
Yes, well, actually, one of the first uh, advice is really to start as early as possible to have um, this dialogue uh, process between the, the different levels to really build the, the content of the, the programs and the correlation between the different objectives coming from uh, the various levels, uh, including the, the sub-regional level. So this is really something that we, um, that we promote. Of course, the, the partnership, this collaboration between uh, the different authorities, also the citizens, uh, all the types of stakeholders to really try to have a broad uh, consideration for uh, the needs uh, that are really um, uh, there on the ground and that have to be uh, considered uh, as much as possible. So we really very much insist on, on having this, uh, this, partnership, um, this partnership approach. Um, another, another thing is also, of course, to, um, to take advantage of the, the flexibility that we are now offering with uh, notably this new policy objective five. This is really an opportunity to mix different uh, priorities and to have a very specific approach uh, designed for, for the territorial level that is the most relevant. So we hope that this could be also something that, uh, that could be very useful uh, to prepare for, for the new period. And, and maybe one last point would be also to, um, for cities to, to really uh, get in touch with their managing authorities because we also uh, have this possibility of using the, the technical assistance budget um, even under the current period to prepare uh, for the strategies and um, the, uh, the uh, objective for the new period. So this is also something uh, to consider. Uh, so these were my main, uh, my main points. Thanks so much, Laura, for joining us and for giving that sort of look into the future. Some really strong lessons there about getting prepared. And I think a lot of, uh, a lot of what you said reinforces what we've heard from these really inspiring cases this morning about taking a partnership approach uh, working with colleagues, connecting across sectors, uh, and, and using technical assistance to get yourself ready with good projects lined up for the next program period. So thanks so much for that. Um, we're going to go into wrap-up phase now. Um, thanks for staying with us just past the hour. What happens next? Um, the webinar content that you've heard today will be available on the UDN Handbook shortly. Uh, sorry, on the UDN Handbook website shortly, as well as a video of this webinar and the previous webinars. We'd like you to make full use of the handbook. Tell us about your projects too on social media with the hashtag UDN webinars. And I'm going to bring in Carlotti Fioretti, who started us this morning with our uh, introductory session, to maybe come back and give us some calls to action uh, and some reflections on what you've heard this morning, Carlotta. Yes, thank you, Sally. So I think that the calls for action uh, comes from our speakers, in fact. Uh, we learned a lot from them today. Uh, so I, I, I want to, uh, to tell you the main three messages that I've learned from our speakers. The first comes from uh, Alessandra presentation, and I think that the advice is to start a dialogue between the managing authority and the city's local authority on the priorities from the next programming period. So it's something that it's uh, urgent and must be started uh, uh, right now. The second advice uh, comes uh, from uh, Nikolai, and I think that uh, another call for action is to identify possible net bottlenecks in implemented integrated projects. So impl the implementation phase is a key phase uh, in order to deploy integration. And finally, what we have learned from Ghent is that you can adopt good practices uh, to uh, enhance exchange and discussion among teams, among departments of your local authority. Thank you very much. Thanks, Carlotta. Uh, really good messages there that we can all take from this morning. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for staying with us this morning. Really big thanks to our uh, contributors, to Alessandra, to Nikolai, Heidi, Adele, and, and Laura. I think we've all learned a lot. It's been really rich. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge and experience with us this morning. And now I'm going to hand over to Ed, who can tell us about the next webinar in the series. Thanks, Ed. Thanks a lot, Sally. Uh, thanks, everyone. Yeah, very, very quickly, uh, our final session, sometimes if you hear the word funding and finance, you might want to hide under the desk. You might want to roll your sleeves up. So. Um, we are going to be looking at the money question, which has come up in every one of these sessions, including today. Uh, we're going to have three really interesting uh, inputs, one from Athens talking about combining EU and domestic funds, uh, one from Bilbao talking about how we um, take a multi-sectoral approach to these funding packages, including 
involving the private sector, linking cohesion policy and smart specialization. And thirdly, we'll be hearing from Gothenburg in Sweden, who will be telling us about their green bonds, a good example of financial innovation. We also have um, an EIB rapporteur with us, uh, lots of uh, great content to, uh, to share with you. That's on Thursday morning, so 19th of November, same time, same place. Uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks to Sally. Thanks to everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day and look forward to seeing you in a couple of days' time. Okay. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks, Eddie. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Have a good day.